five pinots is different? How? Yeah. What are some of the words you're thinking of? Like if you were to describe Santa Barbara Pinot Noir now to say your table side with somebody, what are a few of the words you would use? Elegance. Elegance. Good. Savory. <clears throat> what else? Complex. I think California in general, other areas of California have become so set on heavier fruit styles and that's what they think they're doing. One, I think this is a beautiful representation of just stylistically true Pinot Noirs from where they're coming from. You're hired. There you go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, I, that's what I look for on a wine list is I want stylistically true. I don't just look at, okay, this is, yes, it's important to know what your membership for me is. Uh, sure. Uh, would want, but there's beauty in stylistically true wine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same trick that. Yeah. The of all of good, huh? Best in the Yeah. Fruit and non fruit, she said. Are fruity or earthy. And my takeaway from this is that both the fruit and non fruit flavors are like right there. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Fruit and non fruit flavors. Over here. John. I wonder if the. Uh, the wine makers of these five Pinots could tell us their favorite clone, the one that they couldn't live without, and why. Their favorite clone, the one they can't live without. Let's just go straight down the line because because we you know it's a great it's a good question, right? Uh, but let's just hear straight off from your gut, Jill. Um, from my gut, it's really as many I have to say. Four. But it's hard to choose one clone because you want to use those many tools. Sorry, clone four. What did you say? Yeah, same thing. I don't know. I find that question hard too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, there's so there's such a myriad of factors that goes into making a bottle of wine, you know. But you can't That's live without what. what? Right. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Y
evolution and regeneration because everything that, that was old is new again, right? STEM, STEM inclusion, that's a strictly Burgundian practice until 15, 20 years ago, largely. And people are still kind of trying to figure it out. Is it part of their war? Right, our stems, you know, part and parcel of, of what we would include in, in a definition of terroir. Let me ask you this, because we ask every city we go to. And please, let us see your hands, because we, we're going to show you whether or not we, what we think of it. <coughs> Is man a part of terroir? Hands up if you believe so. Is man a part of terroir? Uh, uh, yeah, I would have to say so. Okay, and so, as you can see, not everybody up here thinks so. Why do you think man would be a part of care work? Anyone? Steve Plow. You didn't raise your hand. <laughs> Why didn't you raise your hand? Tell, let, tell me. I, I know you to be a thoughtful yeah, wine person. A big, it seems like a big question to unpack right now. Um, it is a big question. Uh, well, you got I a big mind. To, I think I think we have the capacity to impact our water, right? Like how do we take care of the land that's important to our, in our, in our organization, and, and um, you know, and then how do we interact with the land? But um, I guess ultimately, when I think about the concept of terroir, it's all that's locked up in place, right? And we're just kind of like caretakers of that place, right? So I don't know if I feel like we're, we're necessarily. Okay, so he, he said, basically, we're caretakers of the place. We're not necessarily locked into the place. And I respect that, but I don't agree with you. Okay. <laughs> Stevie, I love you. Uh, over here. Thoughts? Thoughts on terroir, man, being part of terroir? Well, I think that, um, like, a terroir individually, on its own, like, if you just go somewhere and you don't farm that land, um, terroir doesn't have anything to do with man, but when... I grew up farming, and when you farm a specific area, there's an, uh, a synergy that happens between the farmer and the land. There's an under, like there are things that adapt within the soil. So like you take, even on a scientific <laughs> level, like, like the, way, the way that you farm a place changes the soil, changes the soil composition, like changes the, the, the amount of nitrogen you have based off of how much. Give, take. So, so, so of course man is part of terroir because as you're farming the land, the land's going to adapt to change based off of the soil. Yeah, and Chris, your father was an evolutionary biologist and plant plant evolutionist. He had a lot of science. Well, mm -hmm. I couldn't agree mm -hmm. more with the assessment, and I think that that's part and parcel of what we do. Is, I think because the way you look at it, you don't want to study. Oh, absolutely. We don't have an equation. We don't rely on some like chemical recipe, right? We give an expression of that place in the glass. That is our theory. That is our philosophy. And naturally, there's a bit of a give and take, right? You make educated mistakes. Sometimes you are surprised and something is serendipitous. You're affecting the microbiology of the soil. You're affecting the vine. Even the decision of where to grow in the first place and what to plant is a reflection of man's influence over terroir or part of terroir. But the fun thing for us is that we have a luxury in this industry that I think is outside of commercial commodity farming. And that is that you're not only playing the short game about the next harvest, right? But you're playing the long game, too. You're anticipating what the region is going to be like in 10, and 20, and 30 years, right? And some of the decisions we make influence the terroir that my father made and that I am making for my sons are meant to have them be the beneficiary of that and that long-term thing. Chris, to that point, um, what does the pioneer um, see for the future. Uh, oh, what's in the future? What does the pioneering young know, spirit think of the future of uh, County? I'd like to see uh, Los Alamos get uh, more of a conversation, right? That middle valley, that uh, second siren, if you will. Right there, guys. Um, you know, I think that describing the differences of that, the terroir, getting that to be a little bit more of a conversation for, for people is going to be critical. Um, and we need to really build this region in the minds of folks. Now, you've heard all the reasons that we think it's special. And when you look at that, the east-west orientation, 100% marine soil is the longest growing season anywhere that we make wine in the world as a family. That's special. 
So I think that there's also a conversation about place that needs to happen, you know, as we explain it to you and you explain it to your consumers, because there is something unique about the characteristics of these wines and umami, that rightness, holistic rightness, seed rightness, skin rightness, stem rightness, that deserves to be spoken to. So we're still in the trenches. We're still, uh, you know, building the region up. We're getting more notoriety, more critical reception. It's happening because of the people to my left and my family. And it's a concerted effort. And uh, on that note, I just want to say thank you for sharing this experience and talking about our home with us today. Yeah, right on. I got a question that hadn't come up before. When we were looking at ADAs and all of that, um, in the six different ADAs in the area, and I just Googled something quickly on my phone, about 8% of the land in the ADAs, the acreage, is planted yeah. right now. Yeah. What? And obviously, there's some areas that are going to be more difficult to plant than not. But I mean, people who live there in the area, going to be more planting going on going forward? Yeah, great question. Yeah, well, it's actually great. Santa Barbara is one of the most difficult counties to get permits for these days to name. So I think that probably not, there won't be very much more planting. There will be a small amount, but no. not much. So they actually don't want any more wineries. They, they're very restrictive in their, in their mindset. The further west you go in San Maria Valley, it's all row crops. And the, the cash crop in Santa Barbara County is still strawberries, strawberries. and then broccoli <coughs> and then grapes. So yep. we're not going to extend it into the western side of the valley. But you know, that's like Oregon too. Oregon is, a, if the Willamette Valley is at about 4 to 6 percent planted, right? Sonoma County is much, much higher. It's, it's in the tens. So uh, it, it is something to consider, which is, Wide open spaces and biodiversity, that's a good thing. There, there can be nothing wrong with that. Uh, let's get into the Chardonnay. So, let's talk about the Catherine. Yeah, so Catherine's Vineyard. Um, we talk about Santa Maria a lot and the bench. Um, and I know Randy will talk about more the filet, the filet within the Cambria property, but this is, again, a nice blend uh, from different parts of the vineyard. We have that vine age, um, and talking about windows of picking, uh, when people ask wine making, it's a lot of decision making, and uh, the picking time is definitely key in wine making. Um, and, uh, I'm lucky to work with a wonderful vineyard team that's been there forever, and I'm not sure, um, I know a nicer vineyard manager, but Matt is amazing and lets me kind of play a little bit, so say I'm just, I'm still getting to know the block, so I might want to pick part of the block a little bit earlier, try the block a little bit later. Um, the, late, the older vines can definitely hang on, they um, ripen a little bit slower, but they're still so beautiful coming in. I mean, even uh, Cambria will start picking and then slowly uh, Randy stuff will come into the you know, old vines and it always is looking great. And again, something beautiful about walking along those vines. Um, and this uh, Chardonnay just really shows uh, Santa Maria, the bright acidity, the tropical fruit, um, and really nice balance there. And we, Cambria has always been a barrel fermented Chardonnay. We've been dabbling a little bit, just adding a little bit of stainless to just kind of bring a little bit of freshness. So I think you really see that in this wine today. Could you um, speak a little bit about the uh, vine age of the tree? Uh, that's, I mean, the youngest planting was kind of what I did. Yeah, so that's a vine uh, And actually, 80% of this blend are coming from the vines that are planted in 71. So that's really something special. Uh, a lot of it is that clone four. So if you ask the same question about Chardonnay, I'd say clone four again. Um, and it, there is something really, I mean, again, in different areas. So we have these old vines on the western part of the range and old vines on the eastern part, and they're all, they're both so different. And again, bringing in um, great flavors for the blend, and like it equates to that vine age. What's the whole So it's, uh, 80% barrel fermented and a little bit of 20% new. You mean specific coopers? No. Okay. Yeah, so 80%. And that the barrel fermented part goes through full mallow, uh, the stainless part gets stopped, um, so that is partial. It's only the three, just seems like so much more vanilla than the other ones. So the gentleman's saying that he felt like there was a little more vanilla on the, on the capital. Um, yeah. I agree, especially because the, the second wine is super powerful given its fine age, right? And the third one doesn't have any. 
So, uh, but I wanted to just stop for a second and, and, and just check in with you guys now that we've checked in about the Pinots. What are a couple words that you could use for the Chardonnays? <coughs> Anything? Lemon lime. Tropical. Tropical. What's that? Tropical. Apricot. That's it's the first time in this city, it's the first time I've picked it up, especially on the bird of What else? Solidity. Solidity. Yes. What else? Well, it just it fills the palate. Fills the palate. Yes. Yes. And then, again, there's a savory character, right? Let's think about shells, oyster meat, right? Vibrancy. Yes. Excellent. And how about you guys? Uh, the one word you'd use for Santa Barbara Chardonnay. Greg. Greg and Adam. Saline. Mm. They're the saline twins. Yeah. We were, we were separated today, so I'm kind of like my little island over here. Yeah. Separated for. That was my boy. I had to separate. Ah, <laughs> uh, John. Nervy. Nervy. Tropical. Citrus. Exuberant. Body. For me, it's savory. Again, back to savory, uh, because. Uh, being in education, sometimes you get like five seconds with somebody, right? And so, again, citrus and saline for sure. But every wine in this flight has a savory thread running through it, and it's fascinating to watch. Uh, Randy, let's talk about Camelot. Can you go back to the map? Please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And we, we are running back and forth, but that's okay. Good. Okay. We like visuals. Yeah. <laughs> so, so something that's kind of interesting in the Santa Maria Valley that is somewhat depicted here is that aside from the valley being east-west, as you head into you know, the Santa Maria Valley from the from the west, you're heading out towards the Cambria Winery, Byron, and many of our vineyards there. Most of where the word Biancito is, over to Byron. That little strip of land is a bench. And it is 150 plus plus feet off, up straight up from the from the, the river bottom there. And you fall off and it's straight down, by the way. And you don't want to go over the edge. But uh, that is a that is the filet mignon of the Santa Maria Valley. It is a beautiful bench. And then right about where the word uh, Cambria is, that that bench starts to hit against the little hills there, the roly poly hills. And that's the Camelot thing. And that is the filet of the filet. <coughs> That's what this glass of wine does, the Camelot uh, Chardonnay. So this is 100% of the old clone four on the old roots, the original vineyard there. And one of the neat things that happens when you get kind of on the upper side of that bench is you get this sort of rich, oily viscosity in the palate. Uh, it's very similar to another location in California, which would be Carneros. It's the only other place where you get that oily, lush, this, this uh, richness. In fact, the wine is so rich, this could be uh, sold as a liquid meal. Right, meal to glass. Not eat anything else, but right. just this wine and fulfill your delights. <laughs> <laughs> He's hired. He's hired. <laughs> Uh, the great wonderful. expression of that neck of the woods. For sure. Yeah, any comments on this? I mean, you have to admit, given the amount the, uh, of texture and roundness, like voluptuousness, like Greg, I have to see shapes uh, when I taste things. There's a lot of things out there. If that happens to you, or it's still vibrations or color or that kind of thing, you're a um, This wine is like this. I mean, it is this brown. Is but then there's this really firm lacing of acidity. Mm. Where do you come from? And so it like cleans it all up and you kind of go, oh, man, that was exciting. And that is a hallmark of Santa Barbara, period. Uh, yeah, let's get to this stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, does anybody think these uh, wines are, are special in this one? It's fruit corn. Fruit what? corn. Fruit corn. Yeah, does anybody think it's uh, corn? Oh, yeah. No. No. 
it's sweet, right? And the perception of sweetness, but it's not too much. It's not flat. I think that's that by nature, Randy and uh, Joe were talking about. I think that's a hallmark of the wine growing season. The acidity, the minerality, that purity through these Chardonnays keeps it balanced and complex on the palate. Yeah. Okay, and then let's go to a valley over and talk about Santa Rita. And this is a bit of a departure, no? From the other ones? Yeah, it's very different. First of all, raise a glass to Randy Ellen. Yeah, we're ready. So bad. Yeah, we're ready. Make sure to try Cheers. 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 Thank you. Hey. To share a stage, I'm no spring chicken, but to share a stage with Randy is like a, it's a big deal, and he's such a legend in our state. So, all your respect. Thank you. Um, can I have a quick interview? Um, it's an emotional trip together. Ah, good. Uh, so Santa Maria Hills. So I'm asked all the time, like, right? oh, compare Santa Maria and Santa Maria Hills. Santa Maria is is taught. And it's very pure, and it's, it's, it is more exuberant and tropical than what's referenced down the table. San Rita Hill is even picked right, and I, I do. I, I've, I've produced Chardonnay since 17 years old. I've done some crazy stuff. Um, within, that, within that aesthetic, even, it remains in citrus. You have lemon, lime, salt. It's almost like this. I mean, it smells and tastes like this. Yeah, sorry. Won't get to that. But it, um, it really, it's that. It's a constructed margarita. And again, going back to my condiment thing, um, what do lemon, lime, what do lemon and salt do with food? They lift, they cleanse, they elevate. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a part of a dish. Yeah, it's not even paired with food, it just lifts food. Um, and that's what Sarah Rita is really, really good for. Um, our priority set at work is, is a state of neutrality. So all very, very old barrels. In fact, now we get Randy's handing up barrels. It's great. Um, like a younger sibling. But he outgrows the sweater and I get it. Um, but uh, old barrels, no stirring, no mallow. a somewhat different aesthetic. But again, starting with this kind of unctuous, pretty elaborate, exaggerated citrus. Lemon tart, key lime pie, lemon meringue. Rained in and harnessed by what? Acidity, saving. Right? Just like that part to be. So it's, it's intense. This is a massive wine. Deceiving me so in some ways. Um, because it's like you starting at the bottom of an hourglass. And it's a very high strung interpretation of place. Um, and that's kind of what, what this wine's all about. Um, but I think, you know, collectively with the three, with the three shares, that intensity and purity. And, and it was really fascinating hearing some of the commentary around the room. Because I heard at the same time, both of you have friends who said it, sorry, but it was like lemon, lime, mouth filling. Like, when does that happen? Yeah? Lemon, lime is usually what? Sour, tart, and picked early, yeah. sweet, tart, like nervy, fishy. And then mouth filling, yeah, mouth filling is exotic, hedonistic, come hither, whatever. And the juxtaposition of those circumstances is what ultimately unifies Santa Barbara white and red. Yeah? It's deliberate, it's huge, it's massive, it's giving, it's full throttle. And it's also very exacting. It's very savory, and that's a one thing I'd like to just like drive home as much as Send you away with exactly. And in terms of food and wine pairing, let's let's get into that a little bit. We we've, we've had some really interesting discussions over this week. How do you think you would use these wines in food and wine pairing? Anyone have any thoughts? They're pretty universal. Yeah. 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 I mean, what, one of the interesting things yeah. that we keep encountering <clears throat> is people with sushi restaurants or, you know, Pan Pacific saying, like, these wines, I want these wines. Um, with what, what Greg was saying about wine being a condiment, right? As we all know, you don't need an oyster, uh, you know, wash if you've got a high acid wine. That's the condiment, right? So it's the same notion. Um, we had a guy from Nobu yesterday who was like, these wines are going to be stellar. It never actually occurred to me that with something so savory and with the, the level of umami that I work with, with a, around sushi, that I need wines that are going to rise to that occasion. There's only two things, and these guys have heard this story all week, but I want to share it with you. Mammals and babies, there's only two things they don't spit out. One is sugar because they know that it's critical to the building blocks of their existence, right, for them to grow. The other one is umami. Not a single mammal will spit <coughs> umami out because it hits like a dopamine note. You get very wound up. It's a glutamate. And there's umami in all wines, as we were saying. It's just there's a little bit, they're a little bit more hidden when there's a lot of fruit present. And there's umami in most foods, right? Strawberries, tomatoes, salmon. Nori, 
uh, hard edge cheese, dry aged beef, salumi, right? Going on and on and on. Fish of almost all kinds. So when you put two glutamates together, like these wines and savory foods, you literally get an ecstatic reaction. And that's something that people aren't talking about, but they damn well should be. <coughs> Who doesn't want an ecstatic reaction? Okay? All right. So other questions about the Chardonnays. Do you, do you feel differently now about Santa Barbara Chardonnay, now that you've tasted these three? Pretty remarkable, isn't it? And I think you will see a consistency running through them, even in, in, in our counterparts who are not right. on this. What stage. do you get out of the, the old oak? I mean, I come into your winery and see, I mean, immaculate five to twenty year old, really old barrels, which is very different. We all know what new oak gives us. I always kind of think of old oak along the lines. I mean, well kept old oak kind of like a thong that uh, um, basically, yeah, well, <laughs> no, it, it, it serves its purpose, it serves its purpose, but, it serves its purpose, but doesn't hide the raw material. <laughs> so, uh, what you got out of it? I give them a word that they have to use, and he always wins. <laughs> Well, it, not so much a question as a statement. Um, Pinot, Chardonnay, uh, if you jump over to Burgundy, you know, you can taste wines from here. You can go across a 12-foot road, and the wine's totally different, okay? These wines are totally different. But to me, there seems to be a thread that runs through all of them, whether it's the Pinot or the Chardonnay, that connects all of them, and maybe that's the savory element. Yeah. No, I, 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 I thank you for that. Do you say it's right on connectivity Pardon me? Do you, despite the, the variance of site and clone, and part right. of which we all have too, do you see a thread of connectivity in Burgundy that links Burgundy together? Or is it a really well, I, th I think if you go from, you know, sub-region to sub-region you do, uh, you know, Cote d'Or, uh, Cote d'Or, Cote d'Or, Cote d'Or, Cote d'Or, Cote Yeah, I think, I think there's a similarity there, but from one to the other, there may be a, a difference, and particularly with pairing food. So would you go there, maybe continental climate versus maritime climate? And yeah. Maritime perhaps uh, leads towards more similarity, I mean, the ocean being a, a a huge, huge fa the factor in many, many ways. While in England, there are more differences. I mean, you get hailed on here, but not there, kind of. Right, yeah. Yeah, and each region sort of obsesses about different things. When we do, uh, like when we hang out with our Oregon winemaker friends, all they talk about is soil. They're total rock lickers. They're just constantly <laughs> obsessing about, about soil. And in California, of course, we know this, that, that over the past 30 years, we've obsessed over climate. Well, now we're beginning to recognize in a place like Santa Barbara that we have to consider both elements. We're starting to soil ourselves now. Yeah, we're going to. I'll take that. I'll take that. Yeah. 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 I think we need to pay him double. Yeah. 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 It's a beautiful comment, so I think it's also a lot of context. Yeah, so, you know, in, in the case of if you're there in Burgundy, you're going to all the villages, the emphasis will be on articulating this specific elements of those villages, right? The, the impetus here is more of a collective kind of stroke, all by, with our own expressions. Um, but, you know, it, the, the continuity of the zone thing is kind of like Santa Maria, Santa Maria Hills. I mean, it's the, not in one, not one, not another, I love playing that game, but, but the, the juxtaposition of the siblings. We have three really with both houses, which could be Mackle, if you want to rip on the train about. Um, but 
you know, that's that. So within all this, you know, that's fine. And if this were solely a Santa Maria situation, I would suspect that it would be like the Cambria side and the, the Nielsen side and, you know, really have, yeah, yeah. But, you know, and so and there's kind of that, that framework too. And I think ultimately, hopefully, with this, it was a, a very inclusive Santa Barbara thing, much like an inclusive version thing could be. I enjoyed uh, your comment too. Um, I think savory is definitely a common thread, salinity, that coastal influence, almost in the aromatic and on the palate. Uh, that form, uh, for me, there's also a textural element. And I'm not trying to superimpose my palate on you. But in other regions of the world, in other parts of California even, you do run with hot spells into a situation where you could get a tremendous amount of sugar ripeness without necessarily the skin ripeness or the seed ripeness to it. And texturally, you could get something with a green tannin that's a little bit out of whack, right? For me, across the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay, you don't really run into that problem in Santa Barbara as much as ever. And I hear Greg talking about spending over a quarter century and not having to pick because of adverse weather conditions. That's incredible. So just in my palate from a blending component, you know, and I think Randy sees it the same way. If you're talking about a holistic blend like what we do at Kendall Jackson up and down the coast of California, that texture is critical. But I also see a common thread between all the wines here today. Well, it's interesting that uh, we started with the red and then went to the white, and I just went back to the red, and there was something familiar yeah. in the glass yeah, the between... Yeah, I was commenting that when he went back to the red, there was something familiar, and that's absolutely right. That's a that's very astute comment. Yeah. That 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 expresses the relationship. Yeah. Question here. So we talk a lot about salinity, and I agree with Jimmy, which in both of Greg's wines, pick it up immediately, and I wrote it on my notes. What is it about salinity that's coming from the terroir? I mean, where does that salinity come from? Where exactly? It's 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 complicated. are raised in a very vulnerable uh, way. So it, it's, the, there are no other elements to them, right? One can argue stems can be distracted, okay, fine. But, but, but you know, the neutrality of oak you know, is kind of a, a pretty raw template. And so that could potentially exaggerate another element of the wines, which could, could be equal in everything, but there might be some other factors of those levers on the mixing board that might be up a little bit. And, and then that one totally includes the keyboard shot of it's there. Let's open it up to a few questions, and, and after that, we're going to have Scooby Snacks and, and drink more wine. Uh, the gentleman here. So, uh, y'all, we, we're just talking about this <laughs> harmony between you know, like, <laughs> harmony between uh, soil and climate. I'm curious as to as climate is, and as temperatures, and as um, as like. As the climate is changing, are y'all changing the way that y'all are farming the areas? Is there like agriculture that goes and we're, we're, we're looking at things changing climatically all across the West Coast? Are, as winemakers, are y'all seeing that? Or is like the fog and, and where y'all are situated, does that help insulate your winemaking? We've gotten this question in every market we've been in, and which is. Totally fair and, and, it, and, it, and it a really reasonable question. I, I know Mr. Jackson has a strong talk on it. Well, I know that there's going to be the artistic perspective, which I think a couple of the winemakers here are going to share. That is with a tremendous amount of merit. Um, I'll give you a different uh, perspective than I think you intended by your question, but you offered me a podium, so I'm going to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Get comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it reasonably brief, but I want you to get the heart of the principle. There is no doubt in our mind as farmers that anthropomorphic climate change is a factor in our industry. And when you have the perspective of wanting to be a multi-general, rational family culture going forward in the wine industry, you have to anticipate that. So a lot of what we've been doing from a farming standpoint has been to mitigate our environmental impact, anticipating that irrigation is going to become a little bit more problematic you know, the temperatures are going to spike, right? So I'll give you an example. 
we'll do it vine by vine in terms of irrigation. We'll actually take drone footage, look for the hot parts of a respective bench or a respective swale, the cold parts, and gear our irrigation towards where it's needed by the vine. Overall, we're trying to do what we can to mitigate our soil erosion impact, right? And we're trying to be more conservationists going forward because we think that if we can do things more sustainably, that means that we're going to have a more sustainable company culture going forward. So it not only impacts the style, potentially, because the style should be a reflection of terroir, and that is what it is to our family, but it also impacts the way that we allocate resources as a farm. What else? Have any of you noticed? Uh, I, I will say that I see it most strongly in Oregon, even more than I do here. But I think because Oregon is living on the edge, as we talked about, I mean, Greg's comments about how the weather here allows them to pick in. It's completely true. Earlier, later, that type of thing. And it is so uh, influenced by the sea. When you go up to Oregon, more inland, um, I think we are seeing uh, more quote unquote better years, but riper vintages than we've seen. <clears throat> Uh, when I started in Oregon 25 years ago, one out of every three vintages um, were you were able to pick maybe one out of four um, without having thinking about rain, that kind of thing. Now, um, 12, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, we're all that kind of way. But I think you are actually now starting to see people in Oregon plant at higher elevation. Um, the, in the areas that you did not used to be able to do that in. There was this narrow band that you could plant in. You still can't go too low because frost is still can be a concern. But you can go higher um, elevation in Oregon now than you used to be and able to And also on the north side of, of Hillside, exactly. which was not something that you could commonly do. Right. So I think you're going to see it on first, and we are seeing it first on places really on the edge, which makes sense. I mean, that's where you're going to see it first. And perhaps it may be mitigated a little bit down here, all the rainfall irrigation, talking to your sister about biochar mm -hmm. and water holding capacity, things like that, really well, interesting. Oregon's a great point, actually, of soil and climate, right? When you look at Willamette, the reason they didn't want, from an elevation standpoint, plantings below 200 feet is because that's where all of the rich soil was, right? And they didn't have that nutritional deficit, but they thought stress a vine in order to get good ripeness within the fruit, right? Above 800 feet, it was considered to be too cold, right? Which is why there was, within Willamette, when they were dry, dry the uh, AVA, a requirement that you stay below that elevation. Now that anthropomorphic climate change is a factor, they're thinking about extending that, maybe to 1,000 feet, maybe to 1,200. If it wasn't for a change in climate, that discussion wouldn't be happening. The other thing that we're doing is, that, you know, say, in the North Coast, is where we thought it was cool and on the edge, or closer to the ocean, we're going even closer to the ocean. And in the farming techniques, because of the potential for the heat and the sun, we do a lot of leaf work, leafing in the canopy. And you want to be careful, you know, sometimes you don't want to pull too many leaves, you might get a little bit of sunburn, and so maybe a little bit more shading, you know, not a lot, but just a hair more of manipulation of the, of the, of the body that's being done. Yeah, every, it's on everybody's mind, no question. I'm going to just uh, also suggest that um, since we, we wanted to get you out of here on, on you know, the time that we uh, allotted, uh, your time's important, we really respect that. Uh, you'll have time to talk with all these guys at the reception. Please don't leave, stay, hang out with us. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. And I just want to ask one more question of the panel. One word to describe Orlando. <laughs> Sonic Sonic say Disney. Sonic, yeah. Don't say Disney, please. Cream corn. <laughs> you didn't say cream corn. That was our word. 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 So, uh, war. <laughs> Gatorland. <laughs> I'm going to go with two. Warm and friendly. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I say intimate and engaging is evolving. Yeah. What did he say? I say intimate and engaging. So don't lose that. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Please give thank your you applause. Thank you.
bingo.